Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Paula McLean to discuss When the Stars Go Dark, which we just learned is an instant New York Times bestseller. So go, Paula, go. For those of you who don't know, Paula McLean is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Love and Ruin, Circling the Sun, The Paris Wife, and A Ticket to Ride. The memoir, like family growing up in other people's houses, and two collections of poetry. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Good Housekeeping, Oh, The Oprah Ma Magazine, Town and Country, The Guardian, The Huffington Post, and the list goes on and on. She lives in Ohio with her family. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by the wonderful Liz Moore. Liz is the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, Long Bright River, an acclaimed novel's heft and the unseen world. A winner of the 2014-2015 Rome Prize in Literature, she lives in Philadelphia. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of When the Stars Go Dark or any other book from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi, Paula. <laughs> it's so nice to see you virtually. I How know. Are you tonight? The music can't be otherwise. I think it's I fine. We had, we had big snow here. I don't know if you had some in Philly. We had big thunderstorms here. I don't know. I guess I would prefer thunderstorms to snow. I don't Agreed. know. Agreed. Yeah, no, yeah. we don't. We got four inches and that kind of wet, heavy, flocking snow that breaks trees in half. But that is so not OK for April. Um, <laughs> but can I just begin by saying congratulations on making the list? Oh, the New York Times thank list. you. Yes. For those of us in the business, it's it's a really big deal. And it yeah. happens at five o'clock on a Wednesday. I was just <laughs> thinking that when I it happens. when it right. When they announced it, I was like, right, it's it's Wednesday night. That is it's that Wednesday is night at five o'clock. And it's for the the next list. So right. it won't be print until May 2nd. But it is very exciting. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I'm a huge fan of your work and and particularly this book, Long Bright River, which blew me out of the water. And I just think that you I mean, you're a very gifted writer, but you do something really extraordinary in this book, which is to kind of break all the rules, you know, about oh, yeah. what a suspense novel is and and the, the relationship between these sisters, the incredible sense of place, the empathy, the empathy, the tolerance. We're talking about trauma and the impacts of collective and community trauma and Anyway, it's an extraordinary book. And for those of you who haven't read it, read it immediately. But thank you. I've just wanted to meet you. And this is this is how I put my tour together. If you haven't figured it out, it's like, what deep, rich conversations do I want to have? And who do I want to have them with? So, Paula, you are very kind. And um, I feel just the same about your book. Um, I read it. Uh, in in one breath, um, which is rare for me these days, because like all of us, I feel like I'm always being pulled in a lot of directions. So yeah. to have something capture my attention so fully was really uh, not only rare, but also I just feel very grateful for it because anything that can pull me out of my head uh, and pull me out of the news is always very welcome. Um, and I was telling Paula in our virtual green room right before the event that her book made me cry a lot repeatedly, um, and yet uh, always balanced um, its sorrows with with some joys and some just sort of. I'm going to use the word calmness. There was just a sense of like steadiness, like even even the saddest 
moments in the book were balanced by this ever present sense that everything was unfolding and everything was happening for a reason and everything, you know, life was progressing apace with its, in all of its sadness and all of its joy. Yeah, and I noticed um, that uh, I, I sort of had that feeling throughout the book. And then when I was preparing for this event, um, I noticed for the first time, I think I missed it um, on first read, one of the two autographs that opened the book, uh, here is the world, beautiful and terrible things will happen, don't be afraid, which is just <laughs> a stunning, a stunning epigraph and one that feels so appropriate for the book and also for life as we know it right now. Um, so I was just very moved by it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank and you. I I wondered um, I I I wondered for the for for any viewers um, who haven't had the privilege of reading the book yet whether you would like to just sort of position it from a story standpoint. I assume yeah. most people know the basics, but how much more would you like to say about what the book is all about? Yeah, I'll just give you kind of the the down and dirty, the freeze dried, as mm -hmm. they say. Um, anchor points. So my main character is a missing persons detective based in San Francisco who has a terrible tragedy in her personal life that sends her running back home. For her, home is a really complicated notion as it is for me. So like me, my character has grown up in foster care, but the principal place that she considers home is Mendocino, California, which is a um, Victorian coastal village north of San Francisco. And she goes there to heal and to recover herself. And yet the moment she arrives, she learns that a local 15 year old girl has vanished and against her good sense, she finds herself becoming obsessed with the case. And we realize over time that the reason she's obsessed is because she believes that she's past saving and so she needs to throw her energy into saving someone else. And um, what I would also say about Anna, the way that she's grown up, the way her experience sits on her soul, essentially, has made her particularly susceptible to the stories of those, the disenfranchised, the, the voiceless, and they pull on her. She can't help herself. And um, this is why I'm interested in her as a speaker and why she single-handedly convinced me to jump genre. <laughs> because, you know, it's the first time in a decade that I've had an imaginary character at the wheel. And it's exhilarating to know that I can tell a story I've wanted to tell for a really long time. Um, and it's this, it's this story. It's about trauma and healing and hope and self-rescue and basically how we find each other in the dark, how we come together after the most um, unspeakable losses have come into our lives. Yeah. Which is also very appropriate for the time we're living in. It right? is, it is. Um, so that leads me nicely into um, a question, which I like to, to ask all writers um, in conversation, which is different than what was your inspiration for this book? Because that question, it's almost impossible for me to answer yeah. ever. And I oh, imagine yeah. it's a difficult yeah. one. It's so broad. But yeah. instead, I'd love to ask you, um, what was the first thing that arrived to you about this book from a craft perspective? Was it a, was it a character? Was it a voice? Was it a scene? Was it a setting? Was it a combination? What came first? I love that question. And you're right. Inspiration is so, it's so mysterious. Like mm -hmm. what is creativity? Where do these ideas come from and why do they visit upon us? And it does feel a little bit like a visitation um, I was actually in the middle of writing my third historical novel, Love and Ruin, and in my imagination, in my life, at my desk every day, I was actually in Madrid in 1937, surrounded by Franco's army, you know, and the speaker of that book is Martha Gellhorn, who is one of the, you know, foremost war correspondents of the 20th century. So that's where I was. 
Mm -hmm. And then I went for a, a dog walk and this character came to me, this character that I've just described. Um, and then at the same time, and I think this is pertinent, the setting came to me. A reader once said, where are you taking us next? After reading Circling the Sun, which is set in colonial Kenya. And it really resonated with me because for me, setting is just so much a part of how I get there as a writer, projecting myself in to that world and populating it. I think it's the kind of reader I was when I was a kid, mm -hmm. disappearing into worlds. That's my favorite thing. It's my absolute favorite thing. You know, I would disappear in the stacks when I was a elementary school kid and I could read two and three books a day. And what I wanted more than anything was that magic carpet ride where everything else fell away and I was just there. And as a writer, this needs to happen too. I like pull the story in around me, right? Like a cocoon and it starts to feel real. And so when I had the idea for this character, I knew immediately where it needed to be set. So Mendocino, California, which is home to Anna, like home home, like, you know, um, is a really important place to me. I grew up in California. I haven't lived there since I was in my 20s. So this was an opportunity for me to write a love letter to my home state. Um, and if you've not been there, it's not, you know, you think California coastline, it's not Malibu. It's like Maine, you know, and it's like the kind of rocky, rough, turbulent, stormy, the Pacific can be like, want to eat your face. You know, it's a, it's a big, cold, mean ocean. And here's this beautiful Victorian village perched on a bluff above this ocean and then surrounded by old growth redwood forests. And even in the summer, the fog will steal in and be so thick that you can't see your hand in front of your face. And that is the weather of the book. That is the emotional weather and the atmosphere and the, the world that came to me. And so to me, it was like a one-two punch, a long answer to your very good question. Mm -hmm. This one-two punch and these things seemed very much knitted together, like that the character needed to have this profound relationship with this place if it was going to work. And we as readers needed to be drawn into the world and to feel that it was real, that we could step out of the page mm -hmm. and into this world and that it would hold us. That is a great uh, description of Mendocino aloud. And it reminds me of the descriptions of Mendocino that are in the book, which really do sort of suck you in and make you feel like you're right there. Um, and okay, so I'm teaching this course right now at Temple here in Philly that I designed and it's called The Invented Self Autobiography as Inspiration for Other Written Forms. And as part <laughs> of the course, we go we the students grad the it's a grad class they all they read um auto fiction there's one unit on auto fiction there's one unit on autobiographical screenplay and there's one unit on um autobiographical poetry and i read i don't remember if it was in an interview or an article about you that you described this book um when the stars go dark as the most personal book you've ever written which struck mm -hmm. me because i think if i'm not mistaken you've also written memoir is that right yeah. Mm -hmm. So how can you walk me through that that statement and why tell me a little bit about why this feels like the most personal book you've ever written? Uh, so I think for those of us who traffic in fictional worlds, we're always being autobiographical, but usually it's subversive. You know, it's all of the details of the world. It's how the kitchen smells right? It's a particular feel of a dog's fur or whatever the details are, the furniture of the world that we're building, those things are almost always there. You know, we, we reach out and touch them and we pull them in and that's, those are the details. Um, but for this book, and I think probably because it's that for 10 years, I have been 
overwhelmed in the best sense of the word by the stories of others. Mm. Hadley mm -hmm. Richardson, Hemingway's first wife, and Beryl Markham, who flew the Atlantic in 1936 and was a badass and a racehorse trainer in colonial Kenya, like their stories felt personal to me, but they just took over, right? Like those, that's the plot and that's where I was going. And and so when I knew I was going to write this book and, and basically anything could happen, um, I didn't immediately know that it, that it would be something that so close to my heart and that was animating the story mm -hmm. um but you know how it is like <clears throat> there can be these great surprises in a novel, and you realize oh that's why i'm here that's why i'm telling this story instead of an, another story and so when i started to reach for memories because we're always building a character from the inside out and the outside in and the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top Pop and informing their their thoughts and feelings and hearts and minds and they have backstory and here I am giving Anna backstory and her her backstory is resembling mine and her attachment to her character the reason that she recognizes Cameron Curtis the banished missing girl in a profound way is because they share and emotional DNA. They're both displaced people. So Cameron Curtis was adopted. And as soon as Anna learns this, she's like, oh, now I know something that I didn't before, but I know something that's actually quite important about her primal wounds, you know? And then maybe this is some of what she's wrestling with. So why did I make my victim a child of adoption? Why did I make my detective someone who's grown up with the same uncertainty and displacement? And because it felt like I was starting to tell the truth, the closer I got to that experience. And then the last point is, yeah, I did write a memoir. It was published in uh, 2003 by Little Brown. It's called like Family. And it is still in print. Like it's a book that I I'm still really proud of. I wrote about my experiences growing up inside the California foster care system. I spent 14 years bouncing around um, with my two sisters. When I wrote that book, I had just graduated from the University of Michigan with an MFA in poetry. And so the book is very lyrical and I wrote it all in first person, but super, super close. Of course, first person, it's, it's a memoir, but you know what I mean? Like close, close, like in scene in the voice of the girl I was without ever having this larger, wiser, older, more informed voice that will then dissect all of that and to say what it felt like. And honestly, I didn't know what it felt like to have those experiences because I had never done any therapy. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Never advise you to write a memoir. I don't know what you're telling your students, Liz, about writing about your life without ever really parsing it for yourself emotionally. But I didn't know anything about trauma. I didn't know really anything about what it was that I was carrying and how it could still inform so many of the decisions that I was making. So, you know, this is really, I'm fascinated as I'm sure you are. In fact, I know you are in human psychology, depth psychology. What makes people do what they do when they do it? And, and so I just gave Anna all of my obsessions so I could spend more time with them. Mm, I love that, yeah. There's, um, <laughs> I, I'm stuck on this course because I just finished teaching it, but if you've never, have you, I don't know if you've ever read the work of Kathleen Collins or seen any of her films. Um, mm -hmm. She was an under, uh, a, a a a screenwriter and director and fiction writer um, in, who who died in the late 80s, whose work was has been brought back to national attention by her daughter Nina Collins, who was my first agent, which is a whole other story. But <laughs> Kathleen Collins was a was an amazing black filmmaker who was never recognized in her time, and um, there is this masterclass, a Kathleen Collins masterclass that you can watch on YouTube all about her process of creating character 
mm-hmm. uh, from her own obsessions. That's one of the most artistically invigorating things I've seen in recent history. And for those of you watching this, go search for Kathleen Collins' masterclass in screenwriting. Even if you have no interest in screenwriting, for anyone who's a reader, it's it's just a breathtaking excavation of inspiration. And she too was so, um, so, I guess eloquent in the way she expressed how her obsessions become in what her characters become invested in her own uh, Mm -hmm. obsessions. Um, It was, yeah, it's really cool. Um, No, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm writing things down. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Go, go after in all your spare time while you're, while you're on this virtual book. You're the one with the one year old and the four year old. I don't know how it is that you're also teaching and writing and. I am, um, hanging in there and I'm going on sabbatical for an entire year next year. So that's what I have to look forward to. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you, you talked about how Anna Hart sees sort of, she, she sees herself and Cameron Curtis a little bit and, um, uh, it's almost like their minds are melded a little bit too. And one of the things that I, uh, was really interested in about this book is how you, the author and, and Anna Hart, the character are not afraid to go to a place that's a little bit supernatural or otherworldly. It's not a supernatural <laughs> novel at all, but it witchy. definitely, a it's, witchy. witchy is a better mm-hmm. word. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there's this amazing line in the book where I think Anna's looking at herself in a mirror and she says, every sign is the same sign. I'm supposed to find Cameron Curtis. It's like this moment of revelation that I think is very well, right, very well phrased. Um, And then there's the Tally Hollander character who I loved, who's an actual psychic, a a self-proclaimed psychic, psychic medium, yep. Mm -hmm. So tell me about um, either your research into the medical metaphysical for this book or your own experience lived experience with Mm -hmm. the metaphysical Mm -hmm. that informed this book can you talk a little bit about that because it's a non-traditional detective story in that way it's a very uh, yes and i guess i um i myself am a skeptic i suppose Mm -hmm. but i've also had experiences that cannot be and rationally and I think as a kid growing up and and for many who grow up with profound suffering or loss of any kind you can become against your own will someone who looks for signs sure someone who looks for a sign that this will all work out somehow because it's my destiny and if I know that it's my destiny, then each piece of this story has a purpose, right? I'm suffering now so that I can transcend later. It's like Greek tragedy, right? If we can see all the way to the end, then we know why there are the trials and tribulations. And so I think I was always, you know, embarrassingly like in a coffee shop looking over someone's shoulder to read my horoscope, but really carefully. <laughs> I love that. Just pretending right. you're not doing and then I got obsessed with tarot cards, etc. But mm-hmm. the reason I put this character, or she appeared rather, in the way that characters appear, and she felt kind of right for this book is not because she's not the kind of psychic who will sort things out for us, you know, who says, This is where the missing girl is. All you have to do is go there. Tally is much more for Anna, a, um, a therapist and a mirror. And if Anna is needing more, much more trust in her instinct, her intuition, her gut feeling, basically what Tally tells her is you're meant to be here. You are meant to be here. You are, and you will figure this out. I mean, essentially that's all she says. She's like her cheerleader, right? She's like the sister voice saying, trust yourself. You can do this. You can go there. And the other thing Tally says and why she's useful to me as a mouthpiece, right? 
is that she shows Anna that everything she's afraid she can't possibly, the weight of her life, that everything she's afraid she's not going to be able to carry, um, that it's there for a reason, right? She shows her that her most serious pain will lead her to her purpose. And isn't that something that is an incredibly hopeful message when we're looking at right loss and and violence and and trauma is that yes there is suffering but there can also be transcendence okay that makes me wish to venture into what is for me the was for me the hardest part of this book to read and probably it's because i have young children um one of whom is at, at one still kind of a baby um there is a yeah. physical separation that is made apparent right in the first chapter um between anna and a child and we don't know i i don't want to give anything more than that away i will stick to what is contained in the first chapter which is that she has been in some way separated from a yeah. breastfeeding okay. baby. She has bronchitis. Sure. She's not able to nurse her child. That's like, I cried in the first chapter because I <laughs> so, I'm so close to that feeling. And mm -hmm. there is something about the act of kind of physically, the, the, Anna as a, as a mother who has been physically separated from a child is there's this sense of just like absolute bodily yearning um, mm -hmm. that I think serves a couple of purposes. It right away establishes that there's a, a great, you know, that the, the tone is one that's full of pathos. You know, there's a longing, the suffering in this book, but also as a plot device, weirdly, it is incredibly effective because I cannot tell you how fast I turn pages like, hoping to see a reunion. I mean, ho partly hoping to see a reunion, partly hoping to know what right. happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this is something that I kind of, um, that I always struggle with um, as, a, as a writer myself of crime fiction sometimes. Um, how, how do we balance the line between like portraying human suffering in a compassionate way and portraying human suffering in a way that turns pages. I I think about that all the time and I wonder if you do too and what are, yeah. what you're, what's the agreement you reach with yourself. No, yeah. I think, I love this conversation mm -hmm. by the way. Um, and you know, that's this the gift of the mm -hmm. book tour by, mm -hmm. via pandemic is mm -hmm. that have this opportunity to have these conversations with each other if I was doing mm -hmm. an event in a bookstore, in Books of Books, for instance, right. you wouldn't be there. So right. anyway, I'm grateful to you. This is wonderful. Um, I've never had to think so much about what turns pages as mm -hmm. I have in the years that I've been working on this book because my past three novels have been as I said, the plot is driven by a life. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have an engine story and that there are things that keep us um, invested as, as readers. Um, they're much more about nuances of character and sort of how we get to the bottom of why, how these characters become themselves, essentially. I've never had to plant clues. Mm -hmm. I've never had to unplant them because I planted them badly the first time or red herrings or how to put my protagonist in mortal peril or peril, mm -hmm. you know, like these um, in a believable way. Mm -hmm. And so it was humbling. There was a lot of humility, but I actually think that humility is something that we should become intimate with. I think we should face all the time the things that we can't do or wish we did better as a way to continue to grow, right? Yeah. I don't want to be perfect at any at anything because that will mean that I've already punched my ticket and I'm already done, right? I'd rather take risks and and flail and fail a lot, which is what I did 
in this book, but I think you're also saying something which I'm a little uncomfortable about, and maybe that's okay that we can talk about it, because I'm telling a dark story as well. And, you know, I was listening to this podcast about, about Greek tragedy and about how uh, we consume others' tragedies. Like in the media, for instance, we do it every day. We did it yesterday with the um, verdict of George Floyd. And um, I don't want to write a book where I'm ever exploiting a story mm -hmm. or taking advantage of um, readers' empathy. But I think that it's a really interesting tension, right? Why do we read? Or I think it's because we want to go on an emotional journey and because we want to know what happens next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and I think, things. yeah, there's, there's, um, there's something, I think one of the reasons that your book is so emotionally resonant is because, how do I put this? It never feels like you are putting your characters in peril just to watch them flail. Like they're in peril because people in life are in peril and it never feels gratuitous. It always feels respectful. Even the separation between like mother and child is, 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 is mm -hmm. intensely thematic. Like Anna herself is, you know, has experienced the separation of parent and child and she's reprocessing that um, in different ways. And there's, you know, the, any, any tragedy in the book serves a central theme in the book um, rather than just sort of like throwing bodies mm -hmm. around. Um, so, and I, I just thought it was, yeah. Thank you. I was just going to say quickly, my one of my favorite reviews so far was actually by Kirkus, which is like a trade review for people in the book publishing industry. Um, and the reviewer just said something like, it's so refreshing to see a book where the victims weren't merely convenient, you know, there to sort of serve, serve the plot. And that was really important to me that it's part of Anna's whole her thing, her, the puzzle of her is that everything that's ever happened, her own loss of her mother, right? The separation with her child. She is intensely interested in how victims become victims. Right. Right. Yeah. She falls into these worlds and she wants to know in a, in a, powerful, profound, obsessive way. Because if we can understand what makes a victim a victim, then we can maybe have those people stop being victims, right? And as a kid, because I'm a survivor of childhood trauma, I always wanted to know what, what, what it was about me that made those things happen. You know, like, how did that happen? And then what did I really learn from it if I learned anything and what I believe is everything that happened to me as a kid awakened my empathetic imagination right so in that way my pain has led me to my purpose in the same way that Anna's pain has led her hers and yeah. so what better vehicle to tell a story that feels true to me right and someone who shares this path so yeah that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's talk about some of the um, sort of more technical research you did beginning. I was fascinated by this and I went down a little some um, internet, some <laughs> rabbit hole. On page 123, <laughs> if anyone has the book and wants to follow along, um, when I was first trained, <laughs> when I was first trained to interview suspects, I learned the read technique of interrogation like pretty much everyone in law enforcement then. John Reed was a Chicago cop, et cetera, et cetera. There's this, there's, there are every so often passages that just give us a little taste of uh, detective technique, um, which is something I am also very interested in. How did you primarily do your research into methodology for detectives? 
Yeah, the way I always do my research, which is to write the book deeply in character, in the voice of my character, and, and in that same way that I like to read when I was a kid, which is just wholeheartedly, right? The magic carpet ride, to be just gone. And usually then I realize what I don't know and I have to read like crazy to catch up to myself. So it's like, okay, lie detector test. So what the hell is that? And how do we <laughs> feel about that? And what? Yeah. how do other people feel about that? And is there a controversy? And if there is, then why is there a controversy? And And so you're right. I do kind of stop the train so that Anna can... In, but it's because I too want the train to be stopped so that I can catch up, right? I want to know all this stuff. I think it's okay. interesting in the same way that when I was writing The Paris Wife, I like stopped the train so that I could learn about what absinthe is and what's the deal with the sugar cube and the perforated spoon and what what is the terminology of bullfighting and you know all of all of that stuff. And then to use those things and get right back to the story where I left it. I think you can absolutely get away with that as a writer if you're writing about things that are as interesting, <laughs> that, that are as interesting to the reader as they are to your character. And that's why, that's you know you've done that when you have readers like pausing in your book and going to Google stuff, which I did frequently. Yeah. Um, uh, so, it means that you found moments, If we can just talk about research for one I'm yeah. sorry, I just interrupted you because I think no. it, I think it I think it matters. Um, there were other moments that were surprises, though, and one of those. So I set the book in 1993. Yeah, because I wanted it to be character driven and not a procedural. It was just laziness on my part. I'm like, I don't want to go there. I don't want you know all those people who watch CSI. God bless you. You know, you know way more than I do or ever want to know about blood spatter patterns. Like, I just want to write this book about this character. And so I'm like, okay, 1993, pre-DNA testing, criminal profiling, pre-internet, pre-cell phones. Okay, crossing lots of things off the list. Um, and so in order to give Anna's voice the veracity I was seeking and the authority I was starting to read true crime, and also starting to listen to some podcasts. And I was just flukily pulled up a podcast um, where an FBI agent was interviewing a retired FBI agent who happened to be Eddie Fryer, who was the lead detective on the Polly Kloss kidnapping. Mm -hmm. And he starts talking and I realized that Polly Kloss was kidnapped at, at knife point from her bedroom in Petaluma, California on October 1st, 1993. That's 10 days after my imaginary girl went missing in the book I'd already drafted and um, 60 miles away. So when I got to that moment, for those of us who look for signs, Liz, <laughs> that felt like a sign and that I needed to include these real victims. And I did it on two levels, I did it in the 1993 timeline. And then in Anna's childhood in the 1970s in Mendocino, there's a series of unsolved disappearances and those are factual as well. Yeah. And so there's this whole netting of the truth yeah. underlying the book. And to me, that feels really important. Now I can't imagine having written the book in another way because these things, these stories happen. They happen all the time. And why not just say that out loud, right? And yeah. to honor to honor those experiences and um, the families who suffered and all of it. Yeah, I thought that was such a cool, um, I was gonna use the word trick, which doesn't quite capture it, but just just the the decision, the artistic decision you made to include real cases in the fictional yeah. cases was so interesting and I have rarely seen that done. And I think you did it really seamlessly um, because I hadn't heard of polyclass. And um, oh. it was only in, yeah, it was only in preparing up? for yeah, the interview. You grew up in Philly? You grew didn't up have in time to. 
Oh, I grew up. I, I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in Massachusetts, and then I moved to New York, and I moved to Philly twelve years ago. Okay, so yeah. I grew up in California, but you know, yeah. so it was the largest manhunt in Cal California history. Thousands yeah. and thousands of just average people yeah. turned up to look for her, and you know, she was on. She was all over. It was like the most publicized, one of the most yeah. publicized. Uh, child abductions in, in national yeah. history. And, but it's an opportunity for me too to have Anna ask what I've always wanted to know, which is why it is that some cases get national media attention and why some kids end up on the milk carton and some don't even get reported. Sure. Yeah. Why why is that? What what's going on there? And so that then becomes part of my story as well. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was just a really cool decision from a craft standpoint. And then it made me think yeah. like, well, who else is doing this? And I'm sure that the, there yeah. are people that do that, but I could, and none sprang to mind well, immediately. Well, I think it also started to feel natural to me. Yeah. Because it's kind of this weaving between fact and fiction is what I've been doing. Yeah, exactly. Day, right? Yeah. Doing all of this research, but then at a certain point, you have to launch into your imagination, right? right. Research can only ever get you so far. Fact can only ever get you so far. And maybe, I don't know, I really like that line. Uh, it I'm worked. In it. Thank I think you. you should keep doing it. Should I keep doing it? Yeah, I think you should. Um, maybe that's my, do it. That's my yeah. thing. Yeah. That can be your thing across any genre. Do do fact and fiction together <laughs> and then make people guess which is which. Maybe, and then I'll come um, to your class at Temple. That would be great. I get to teach it a couple more times. Um, hey, we should uh, take some audience questions now because I just noticed the time. Um, so to anyone who is viewing, you are welcome to um, ask questions of Paula using the ask a question button down at the bottom of your screen. And Liz, I see we Liz, you should yeah. feel free to ask Liz a question as well. Oh. You don't ask me any questions. <laughs> I'm off. I'm off duty. I've done my book tour. I'm done. I'm just kidding. Um, okay, uh, Paula. Here's a question for you that actually relates to what we were just talking about. Um, were you worried at all changing genre gears after writing historical fiction? Yeah, I really was on a couple of different fronts. I worried I was making a terrible mistake just in terms of a career standpoint because I've been successful um, and and wildly satisfied. So why, if it ain't broke, as they say. But on the other hand, when the idea visited, it felt so kind of, it's had such integrity to me and I just thought, I think I need to follow this. And I also, there's a part of me that really likes being over my head and really likes not being able to touch bottom. And I think I had this experience today, in fact, it snowed, I told you, it snowed like four oh, inches weird. on a dog walk in the woods. And the snow was so deep, I decided to go a different way, a trail that I usually know, but I did it backwards because I thought it was gonna be easier somehow. And of course it wasn't easier, but was what wasn't, obvious was I thought I knew this trail, but then I didn't just because I did it backwards instead of forward, right? Sure. And when you don't know suddenly where you are, you start to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. That's what happened to me when I switched genres is like suddenly I, you know how it is when you learn anything new, a new language, like your brain just explodes. Suddenly, my brain was so happy to be completely immersed in this thing. And I was reading lately about flow and why we need it, right? To be, what is it in your life that takes all of your attention, your emotional, right? Your spirit, like all of it. There are very few things, but writing does that for me. And learning this new thing was such a joy and that I was editing the book and that so much was required when I was editing this book when the pandemic started, right? It was a gift to me to be able to go to my desk and to feel um, anchored by the world of the book when so much felt uncertain in life. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I, there's this 
feeling I have sometimes that um, if I'm doing something and I have no idea what I'm doing, I have the ability to like make the make mistakes that eventually lead to good things. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Like you don't know the rules and you don't really know what you're doing. So it, for me, at least, there's almost a sense of like beginner's luck or something. It's like, oh, I can just try this, and then it I does don't something. Think it's new. your subconscious, personally. Yeah. I think our subconsciouses are so much more interesting than our rational minds. Mm -hmm. But more than that, the subconscious traffics and patterns that it's aware of that we're not aware of. And so what I'm saying to you is that even though you don't, might not know what you're doing, somewhere along the line, somewhere deep inside you, you mm -hmm. know what you're doing. You might be processing it in some way. Um, okay. All right, here's another question. Um, the audio version of this novel was amazing. Can you tell us more about how it was produced in the COVID era, how the narrators were chosen, and if you have listened to it, and what do you see as the importance of audiobooks? Okay, first of all, I love audiobooks, and a lot of that is because, you know, we read, I read so much for my work, and then I always have to read books for for blurbs and um, for endorsements. And so sometimes my eyes just give out. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm also in the car a lot. I, you know, I'm in, I do the carpool, right? I take my kids to school. My son, his school is 45 minutes away. I'm in the car three hours a day. And so it's time I can listen to books. Um, Marin Ireland, Ireland does the uh, voiceover in this book and she's absolutely brilliant. And um, I think it is important. Have you ever started an audiobook and the voice is wrong and it doesn't matter if the book's going to be brilliant, you have to quit. Like if the voice doesn't sound right. And so we are usually, we just get, um, the author just basically gets approval and they send MP3 clips so you can listen to voices. And I remember the first time that happened to me, it was when Hadley's voice was being cast and the Paris wife. And it was a horrifying experience because you live with these characters, these voices in your head, and then suddenly, right, they're saying, this is what she sounds like. It's like, no, that's a soccer mom. That's not, <laughs> that's not yeah, my totally. Hadley. That's not my Anna. And so it's it's really tricky. It's really tricky. Yeah, but but fun. Do you like audiobooks? I love audiobooks. Yeah. I um I, anytime I can get away with it, um, if I'm like out for a walk, even with my kids, I'll have like one, one earbud, in, right. just one, so I can also talk to them sometimes. Um, but the, um, yeah. that experience of being read to, yeah, which you know, in fourth grade, I still remember my fourth grade teacher because she read us James and the Giant Peach, oh, and such a good one, Mystic, Mr. Fox, and. And I was in love with her, you know, because of just that, what she could, how, where she took us all. Um, I love that. I love it so. Um, here is a, a really nice question. Can you speak a bit more about how the character first appears to you? Do they feel like they are outside you? They are obviously <laughs> coming from you. <laughs> Do you see them? Do you hear I them? I hear voices. You hear your voices. Um, right. Yeah, and back to this, uh, that you started uh, mm -hmm. prefacing what a complicated conversation this is and just a complicated notion when a character appears. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think of it as going to the movies in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like going to the movies, like there I am out on a dog walk and suddenly a storyline will come to me. And it, you know, it used to happen a lot. You know, I got my start writing poetry Mm -hmm. And I would be, my son was really little then, and I was a graduate student uh, at the University of Michigan and dead broke. And I would just have, you know, I would, I had 12 hours, essentially a week of childcare. Mm. And I was always running for the bus, running for the bus. I spent so much time on the bus trying to get back to my apartment and the babysitter. And so it was on the bus that I wrote my poems. And it was because a voice would come to me. I'd look out mm. the window and I'd see something or, a smell or just something, a line, and then that line would take me into the poem. And I feel like that happens, whatever that is. 
an idea, a thing, a broken paper cup on the sidewalk, something someone says to somebody else in a coffee shop, although we don't do that anymore. But you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. that takes you into that realm where there's where story lives. And I think that our brains, some of our brains like stories a lot. And so I just find myself in the middle of a story and it's like, oh, and then that happens. Oh, I know. And then it's set in Mendocino because it has this crazy physical presence or so yes, it's outside and it's inside simultaneously. Liz Gilbert, if you wanna know a little bit more about this, Liz Gilbert has this wonderful book called Big Magic, which essentially is all about the creative impetus, what inspiration is and how it lives and how it visits us and all of that and much better than I can say it. Great question. Yeah, Um, you mentioned coffee shops or lack thereof, but I'm curious like now, okay, so nowadays, but also, you know, in the middle of the pandemic and also just before it, what does writing look like for you? Where do you do it? What, what it? What's your daily life like? Yeah, and I will answer it if you will answer it, because I'm sure it's what we want to know about each other too, mm-hmm. right? Um, we all we also want to know, and also don't want to know if somebody does it easier than we do, because we're secretly <laughs> sure that for somebody right. like Liz, it's easy. She just sits down and it flows like water. And me, oh my I'm God, I wish knocking my head against a brick wall. Um, before the pandemic it looked like my kids would go to school and I would have this very precious six hours of absolute uninterrupted quiet. And I, you know, I'm super proletariat about it. I won't and protect its protected space. Like I don't, I don't go shoe shopping and I don't have lunch with girlfriends and I don't pick up the phone and call my dentist or my mother or whatever. Like that's, that's the space. That's where I work. And uh, I light a candle, which I've done for you too. Oh, thank you. Um, mm-hmm. Does it have a Does it have a scent, or is it a plain candle? It, I like plain candles. Yeah, um, and I think that too helps me. Like this is sacred space. Like this is I'm planting myself in this space. Um, and then since the pandemic, it looks different because my kids came home for spring break last year, and they just stayed home and I was and my, mine are 14 and 16 my youngest now and I, it's a very different you are in it sister you are in the cave like I barely remember that time except I was clearly writing because mm-hmm. I have that show but I don't remember having that creative impulse but um it was tested at every front I was tested at every front on everything I thought was true about me, like I'm an introvert, <laughs> maybe I'm not, because I miss people. Like I'm just dying over the fact that we're like having this amazing conversation. Like that's the juice, right? That's yeah, the absolutely juice. I know. I think writers writers love to complain about like like literary events and and having to go to them and having and, to get dressed and all this stuff. and now I'm like where is the where are the parties like I want to go to one I never thought I would I really I really want to go to a cocktail party and yeah um, I know Me or too. travel to a book event and have a one-on-one conversation with someone in a of mine and can you imagine um, if this were in Miami instead of snowy Ohio and thunderstormy Philadelphia beautiful I happen to know it is beautiful because I've been to that no um so tell me how your life and Um, what it looks like I will, but also since we're talking about the store in Miami, maybe I should take this opportunity to remind any viewers to press that green button down at the bottom of your screen in order to buy When the Stars Go Dark or any book by Paula or Liz. It says on the screen. I didn't say that. They said it Um, uh, from Books and Books and to support your indie bookstores, as I know you're all doing because you're good literary citizens to come to Zoom literary events. Um, my writing uh, during the 
um, in a non-COVID world, my writing consists of usually going to the same coffee shop like from morning until afternoon and um, spending too much money in said coffee shop and becoming like various stages of caffeinated and then decaffeinated. There's like a peak <laughs> around noon and then a decline. Um, and I, I haven't been to a coffee shop um, since the pandemic began. So now my writing routine consists of in the early stages of the pandemic, just not writing because my husband and I both had our full-time jobs and we had a baby and a toddler and I was just any free, I had no real free time. So I would just, I had to focus on teaching. Then in July, we got a wonderful babysitter slash nanny who is actually here now with the kids because she Yay. comes late she comes late Wednesdays. She stays late Wednesdays and she is the best. You can probably hear me saying this. She, she is my favorite person in my life right now, <laughs> like more than my husband or my children. She is my personal Your hero. And I'm sure she <laughs> is his favorite person. Too. Yeah, we're, we're big fans. Um, but uh, but now that we have childcare again, I'm really, I'm, I'm able to write, but I write just on a, uh, like upstairs in my house, I, I'm in my bedroom right now. I've fashioned a weird office area with like a, a tiny outdoor table looks, and a chair. It looks 100% legit. It looks. This is a dresser. Legit. This is a dresser behind me. It's not a desk. It's a dresser full of clothes, and I'm looking at my bed. So that's where I am because my husband has the actual uh, office with a real desk. So you know what can you do? Anyway, he's on Zoom calls all day long so he won the battle of who has to look more professional on a daily basis well, maybe you guys can renegotiate at some point yeah at some point mm -hmm. anyway um i'm aware of your time and and all of our viewers time so i will just say <laughs> hi again <laughs> and i just <laughs> and i just want to say that you have an open invitation to come to books and books is coffee yes, shop I'll to meet our you cafe there. I'll Come to our courtyard. Bit. That's where I want to see both of you at some point soon, please. Oh, I can't wait. And this has been the most beautiful conversation. Oh, thank you. It's so yeah. profound, so in depth, so terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of everyone watching, you know, I just you've already reminded them, Liz, but one more time doesn't hurt. You know, order your copy of When the Stars Go Dark. We'll ship it right out to you. If you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores, it is our honor to have hosted you, our honor to carry your books in our stores. Um, and I just hope that we will see each other in person soon. Um, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, Paula. You're so lovely, Liz. I hope our you paths have... cross again. I know. Me too. Yeah. Thanks for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night, right. everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.